All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Coulter Mitchell, um, and um, we'll be talking about what you just heard on uh, what Jim just said. But first, I want to thank um, Megan and John, Jim, Maggie for really organizing this and doing such a great job. It takes a lot of work. I know you all know that, but I've really appreciated meeting many of you for the first time in person. That's been really nice. Um, but really, I've just enjoyed hearing all the different talks so far, and I'm sure I will the rest. Um, new data elements I need to think about adding and questions um, has been, it's been really great. So thank you. Um, so these are just the principal investigators. Um, Helen Myers in the back. Um, I'm here, and unfortunately, Chris Monk had to teach and actually run a study. Um, so uh, he couldn't make it this time. Uh, but uh, there is a large group of people, a very large group, and you'll see why um, hundreds of other people doing lots of work to make this all come together. So it was hard to fit all their pictures on mm -hmm. the slide. Um, our U01 uh, is funded by NICHD. Um, and in general, and we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about it. There's a key component that's about essential workers and um, we didn't really realize this until we started getting into this is how many essential workers we have in our data. Um, and then um, also assessing intergenerational, interpersonal um, family responses to COVID-19 and um, using multi-level um, and as many of you contextual data uh, to examine individual changes on uh, mental health, behavior, economic resources, zero, one, two, and four years post onset pandemic. Um, what I'm going to spend most of my time doing is actually describing data because uh, a big part of what we are doing is either adding data resources, um, contextual data, for example, or survey data to an already existing study. Um, and so part of that might be of interest to you because you might want to use it because it's all publicly available. Or um, you might say, oh, there's a huge group of scholars that need my variable that I've created and we can help add that. And so I think that's a big part of why I'm describing this. And that's really been our focus for the first year as well. So the study that I'm talking about is the Future of Families and Child Wellbeing Study. It is the only nationally representative birth cohort currently that will change in the next few years um, in the United States. It is um, representative of births that occurred in 1998 to 2000 in large US cities, um, but has an oversample of non-marital births. Um, it is race, ethnic, um, and uh, SES, very diverse in terms of those measures. Um, and uh, they've been followed now for um, 23 years. Um, and all the data is publicly available. So you have it at birth, one, three, five, nine, 15, and age 21 to 23 will be available uh, next year. Um, but you can see it has measures really, uh, of, for the mother, for the father, for the primary caregiver, schools, um, and even uh, NICHD at one point funded, or still is funding um, genetic data collection, and IMHD is fund epigenetic collection. Um, NIA has contributed uh, biomarkers of aging, so um, it's been uh, very, very helpful, and all of those are or will be uh, publicly available for you. There is a sub-study though, funded by NIMH, um, to study this adolescent to adult neurodevelopment. So at first it was just the cities of Detroit, Toledo, and uh, a part of Chicago, um, but we've actually been able to expand it to include some of the other cities. Again, it's kind of a Midwest focus because they all come to Ann Arbor to, uh, to be uh, have neuroimaging done. So it's an interesting subset of our study um, and um, not surprising, um, we started doing our data collection in, uh, at age 15, and we were doing a follow-up, and it was, um, let's see, January of 2020 when we started, so you can imagine what happened short, shortly after we got started. And so as part of that, yeah, we were doing MRI, and we're still doing it um, now, um, adversity, genetics, epigenetics, things like that, um, but we had to switch to COVID which was great. So we've been able to do a COVID impact study and now we're being able to follow up with that. Um, but this is all focused on mental health. 
So this is um, part of a figure that, you know, we had to all create those figures to describe something that we've been doing. This is part of that. So you, you can see it, but it does help you get a sense of how this future of families and sand um, timelines. So these are already the blue, for example, are kind of the core study when it's happened, or is it when one is the age 22 is, is being finalized and actually they're already going to start planning for the age 27. Um, and there's a lot of data, um, contextual data, survey data, and all those things that I was saying before that if you're at all interested in it, and again, you can have access to it. Um, part of what we are doing as part of this UL one is we have that first impact study that happened really essentially in the first year of the pandemic. And then we have two more planned. Um, there was also a, a, a module in the core for, uh, future of families. And then we have these sand study visits, the MRI visits, where we collect even more. So we have several time points now where we're going to see a subset at least uh, multiple times and get a lot, a lot of data on it. And then um, so that's kind of the data collection side, contextual data, which uh, uh, Helen is, is really leading uh, the efforts on is um, neighborhood demographics. Some of our already exist, but structural racism, which Helen has done a lot of work with, neighborhood investment, and of course, our COVID-19 uh, mitigation and policy data, which I've heard so much about, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, shortly. And so we're really excited about this. But again, a key part for us is creating the data so that many other people who are yard to use the data can use it. And um, yeah, so in kind of the time that's remaining, um, I'll just touch a, on a few papers of people who have already published on some of the data, um, some of which um, we may not even be, um, some of which we're not even involved with because it's uh, just publicly available. So um, one of the things that that we learned really early on was just trying to see, again, this isn't going to be surprising for any of you who have worked in this area, um, but we were just trying to look at um, how many people like lost income or unable to get work or lost their jobs due to COVID. Now remember, these are family pairs. So you have the young adult. So now they're in their early 20s. So this is kind of this prime time of their launching their lives as adults. Um, many of them had just literally left home and then had to come home, return. Um, and so we hear a lot about that. But you have the darker bar is the young adult, light bar is the parent. And it's, this is specifically due to COVID. Um, you see pretty large groups, pr pretty large percentage lost income due to, to, to COVID or unable to get work or actually lost their jobs, especially the young adults. Um, not surprising those with lower SES, lower education, um, that this was even a larger effect. And um, uh, those who self-report as black or Hispanic also saw larger effects. Not surprising, um, but it nice to, to see that it's, it's consistent in our data. But... Um, the thing that I don't think we fully anticipated was how many essential workers we would have. So we had a few questions on essential workers, literally just asking them if they were an essential worker. And we had 34% of the young adults saying that they were essential workers and 51% of the parents saying that they were. Now, we've, we do have reports of their actual occupations. We've gone back with Sarah Burgard, who does a lot of work on occupational status and and. Uh, although the numbers reduce a little bit, it's still very close to this estimate. Um, and so then we started asking these questions about, did you have to increase your hours because of that? Would you, did you have to minimize contact with family? And did you have to live away from family because, of being, because you are an essential worker? And you can see kind of these interesting distributions, again, the darker bars, the young adult, um, and this is one of the things we really want to follow up on going forward is, is what has happened to them um, in this time. Because again, we weren't necessarily anticipating we would have a lot of essential workers to follow up on originally. One of the papers that um, was kind of first published on this um, really tied back into um, mental health and the SAND study that I was mentioning for the um, adolescent to adult neurodevelopment. So this is kind of the neuroimaging subsample, um, which will shortly have around 600, we hope five to 600 uh, longitudinal samples. And so um, a, 
this was done by a graduate student and a phenomenal graduate student, Felicia Hardy, uh, on the adolescent functional networks uh, and, and anxiety symptoms related to COVID-19 economic stress. So um, this is perfect timing, thank you. Um, so I'm not gonna get into the neuroimaging portion of it, um, but uh, Felicia's done a lot of work finding essentially a uh, different density of different networks and showing that um, the subgroup A has a network density that seems to uh, respond to stress differently. And in this case, higher rates of say anxiety or depression in response to stress has found it in other situations. But the question is, is do you, will you see this in COVID-19 related stress controlling for prior mental health, controlling for other types of adversity, specifically COVID-19? And so the economic stress in this case was limited to job loss, income loss, or uh, food insecurity due to COVID-19. Um, and then looking at anxiety and depression using scared and Beck inventories. So again, we have kind of this interesting thing where controlling for the prior 15 years, you can look at age 15, we have a follow-up at age 17, and now during the pandemic. And the short version of it is, is that um, it does really seem to make a difference um, for these different subgroups um, uh, for anxiety. Depression is a slightly different story where it's just everyone went up similar amounts and they didn't respond to the economic, uh, the COVID uh, adversity um, in quite the same way. But, um, but anxiety, we found this, that it was a pretty unique uh, interaction there. And I'm going quickly through all of these, but that's because you're just supposed to get a taste and then you're supposed to come up and ask me about other papers. I'm not gonna give you everything. Um, so this last one is actually uh, just to change kind of the, the whole set of questions is we have their parents. So we have a, a graduate student who was wanting to look at the mental health of the parents. And um, thank you. And um, in this case, uh, she was utilizing this inventory that again, we were doing this a little bit on the fly, right? So it's, it's March, 2020, we're like, we need to grab measures to start interviewing people. So we use um, the epidemic pandemic impacts inventory. I don't know if anyone else has used that, um, but it's 84 items asking, uh, since the coronavirus disease pandemic began, how has your life changed for you and your family? And you report it if it's for you or if it's someone in your household. Um, in this case, we're just talking about how the person, how the parent responded for themselves. And there's a lot of different topics, work and employment, education, home life, economic, and you'll see down at the bottom positive changes to try to capture that there were, for some people, some positive changes that happen. Um, and this time we were able to compare with two different studies, the Michigan twin study, M-twins, and using SAND as well, both of which are uh, focusing on parents and being able to control for prior mental health. So all this is controlling for prior mental health. I'm showing you the wide range of different questions that, that popped up of the 84. These are the, the largest effects, those with stars, past multiple comparison tests. But I'll just generally describe that like, um, in terms of depression, there was this consistent effect of economic um, problems. The higher number of economic problems, the more likely to, to have or higher levels of depression. Um, and economic is like unable to get food or, or healthy food um, or unable to pay bills. Physical is um, things like increases of health problems not related to COVID. But you'll see that positive actually has this negative effect. So, so keep that in mind. We saw a similar thing for anxiety, except it was just economic, home, and physical. Um, and then perceived stress. Um, there's very large increase of perceived stress. Again, not maybe it's not surprising, but in this case, um, economic home and positive. But one of the things that we explore later on is this is not surprising. Even though these relationships hold up in different groups, the means for like positive things, like sp time spent with family or time spent outdoors, varies dramatically by uh, income level and um, size of home and things like that. So even if the relationship is there, the mean differences are pretty are pretty substantial. 
So there's a lot more work to be done with this too. And again, all these data are already available. So please go look for them and ask any other questions you'd like. Thank you.